Hello and welcome to the Great Telco Debate 2020 and our sixth and final debate for this year's event. Investment. How will the DSP of tomorrow be funded? Well, returning for the seventh outing of the annual Great Telco Debate are Chris Lewis and Graham Wilde. Hello again, gentlemen. Hello. Great to be here. Lovely to be back with you, Guy. Now, in a moment, we'll introduce our industry guests, our expert witnesses who will give their views on the topic, and then we'll present our motion. And it's this motion that we want you to vote on, either for or against. And Chris and Graham will do some last minute campaigning to support their views. Graham, what's the premise behind today's debate? Well, Guy, uh, we've heard uh, uh, over a number of years through the great telco debate that the telecoms industry is one of the most extraordinarily capex intensive industries. Uh, and there seems to be no end, in fact, to the need to spend more and more capex as new generations of technology uh, come into being. So. One of the questions is, is there a smarter way to finance the industry? Uh, could we split, for example, uh, the, the, the infrastructure owner from the Servco? That's uh, potentially uh, leads to different investment cycles and it may be more efficient and it may be more environmentally friendly. So it's really about uh, how can we split the way that the telecoms industry operates, if that makes sense, uh, to be more financially efficient in the future? Thank you, Graham. So let's now introduce our industry guests who will be providing their expert witness statements. And I would like to welcome Ulf Ewaldson, Chief Network Officer for T-Mobile, Tim Kelly, Lead ICT Policy Specialist with the World Bank, Amy Wettenhall, Associate Director at Macquarie Bank, and Greg Mesh, Founder and CEO of City Fiber. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Great Telco Debate 2020. Chris, over to you to kick off proceedings. Thank you very much, Guy. The topic of investment is always at the top of the mind, usually of the CFO, but I think increasingly around the, the breadth of the industry. How do we get the right funding in to drive the investment to get us towards 5G, to get us towards more fibre in the ground? So I think you'll, you'll agree that the line that we have here of witnesses is going to help us shape our thinking about the future of the industry and its investment. I'm delighted to welcome Ulf back to the Great Telco Debate. So Ulf, could you please share with us your perspective from T-Mobile in the US about the investment question? Well, thank you very much, Chris and Guy, and thank you very much for having us on the debate uh, this year. Well, obviously, as the Chief Network Officer for T-Mobile, I would say that one of the very big things that we are focused on is the network and 5G. I've been working with 5G, many, many know, for many, many years, uh, since 2012, where we sat down some CTOs in the industry and defined a standard which is not just 4G plus one. It's really a standard which enables IoT to a totally new level with massive machine type communication, with uh, critical machine type communication, things that can happen much more in real time with much higher speeds, making IoT into a new level. We're basically a standard that can create a a platform for innovation, bringing other industries to innovate on top of the network uh, that we are building. In order to get a full uh, uh, leverage on this technology, uh, T-Mobile uh, proposed a merger with Sprint a couple of years ago. We did uh, uh, conclude on that merger in the April of this year. And we have now got frequency assets, which is always the foundation for a mobile industry that no one else have. Uh, we have a very, very strong uh, low band frequency, strong mid band frequency, and a uh, big ultra wide band frequency as well. This gives us assets that we can really leverage on in the investments to make sure that we build a network that has totally new capabilities. We've been working at that very hard during 2019. We launched 5G here in America. We were able to bring what we call nationwide coverage, uh, which was reached in just about one year ago. Uh, that's 200 million population out of the US population that were covered by the network. That low band uh, deployment has now moved forward this year to be more than 270 million uh, subscribers covered by, by, uh, by the low band. On top of that, the merger has given us a mid band frequency of sometimes between 100 and 200 megahertz, which is a very, very high frequency. All of this results 
in very good speeds for not only consumers, but also building that platform that can enable us to invent in, in, uh, in IoT, allow other companies to use our network uh, for things that can, can bring their innovation and realize their business potentials, their goals on top of the company. Uh, the rollout on midband is now so strong that we're upgrading thousands of towers every month, uh, bringing this to 100 million population coverage by the end of the year. Our goal is, of course, to be uh, to be uh, uh, using this network for innovation. But we can already say that we have by now the largest 5G network in the U.S. We have actually positioned ourselves as number two in the mobile war market in terms of subscribers. We passed AT&T just a couple of months ago. Uh, so it's a very big uh, return for us as we are investing in both uh, consumer customers, but also in businesses on top of the network. Thank you very much, Ulf. Great to hear such a, uh, a positive and, uh, and great momentum story coming there from, from the US market. Uh, Tim, with your experience with the World Bank and many years of experience looking at the telecom industry uh, from obviously a World Bank and policy point of view, can you, uh, can you share your perspective? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about... Um, Who's going to pay for the future investment in 5G and new networks and all of that? And in particular, taking the perspective from Africa. So there's a very simple answer to the question, who pays? It's the customer. Of course, it's not always straight away. There's often a, a gap or a lag between um, uh, when the, the network is rolled out and when the, uh, the investment is redeemed. But ultimately, it is always the customer uh, that pays one way or another. And if uh, uh, service providers don't provide the services that customers want to buy, um, then they won't be able to redeem that investment. They'll go out of uh, business. And investment cycles are becoming ever shorter. And that means that uh, digital service providers are ever more vulnerable to changing, uh, changing trends in customer behavior. But the way in which customers do pay for the digital services is also changing. Historically, uh, when I was young, uh, customers paid for their services by the minute, by the mile, and by the megabyte. Uh, but the first two of those no longer apply. Tariffing is, is largely independent of uh, duration of the call. It's largely independent of the distance, certainly on, on the internet. And increasingly, customers pay not, not so much in cash, but rather by exchanging their personal data for the convenience of being able to send an email or to store uh, a digital photo free of charge. So digital service providers resell this data to advertisers who are willing to pay for the attention of the customers. Uh, so increasingly, services are free of charge at the point of use. The value in the market is therefore extracted by those tech giants that can mine customer data and extract value from it most effectively. Companies such as Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Amazon, etc. They've become very adept at doing that and they've been able to extract super profits from the mar market, so much so that most of their owners are billionaires many times over. So for the telcos, they are therefore left with a dilemma of either trying to become a digital content provider themselves or instead uh, remaining a seller of megabytes, wholesale data. And that's increasingly becoming a commoditized market. It's also a market under threat as the tech giants like Google or Facebook start entering the market, for instance, in international submarine cables. So what's different about this picture in Africa? I think there are three important ways in which it's different. Firstly, the cost of providing data is often much higher for telcos, particularly in smaller landlocked nations, and especially when expressed as a percentage of monthly income of consumers. So economies of scale are much harder to realize. Secondly, in Africa, the contrast between rich and poor, between urban and rural, tends to be much more acute. And the social risks of a persistent digital divide are quite, uh, quite severe. And then thirdly, uh, because the per capita income tends to be generally lower in Africa, therefore consumers are generally less interesting to advertisers, and there tends to be less free stuff on offer than there would be in, say, Europe or North America. So the World Bank Group and its development partners have recently posed the question, how much would it cost to bring universal broadband access to, to all of Africa by the year 2030? And the answer that we came up with is just over 100 billion, which in a business as a usual world, about half of that would be expected to come from the private sector. 
But we want to accelerate that process and achieve universal broadband access in Africa quicker than if it was left to a sort of business as usual scenario. So the World Bank has committed to investing some $50 billion in digital projects uh, between now and 2030, half from the World Bank Group, half from the IFC, in order to achieve universal broadband access and to address these areas of market failure. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. It's great to get, I say, di diverse perspectives and obviously put it in the context both of geographies and, of course, of, uh, of economic situation. Uh, Amy, if I might turn to you uh, from Macquarie, obviously from a, a banking point of view, there are many different elements of banking. Can you perhaps share with us uh, the, the area in which you operate and how you see this investment issue? Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Guy. And, and as said, I'm Amy Wettenhall from Macquarie Group. And the comments that uh, we just heard there from Tim are really relevant in terms of that social uh, divide that we're seeing globally. And I, I'm a parent of a nine-year-old. I'm mercifully one of those that's had access to digital connectivity. So she has been homeschooled during the most the majority of this year. But when we look at those 2015 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and I know we're tracking them quite keenly as an industry, it's clear that there is going to be a big gap. We're now in the decade of action to try and close that gap such that those 17 targets can be hit. Um, but in, in order to get there, we really do need to look at investment in a, in a different way. So, so my personal passion is very much to be part of that solution and equally Macquarie's global corporate purpose is to empower people to innovate and invest for a better future. Uh, but saying that, you know, the topic here is investment and we know that businesses can't really be a force for good unless they also achieve their own corporate purpose. So how does that look through a financial lens? Well, we see balance sheets are constrained across the board. On um, the supply side, we know there's been huge investment from our suppliers to get that first wave of 5G that Wolf mentioned previously rolled out and, and, and invested in. Uh, but equally, suppliers are going to need a huge amount of revenue to continue to come in to develop those use cases as the initial proof of concepts roll out and, and those um, industry use cases that will be monetized, be that revenue increase or optimization of OPEX, as they reveal themselves over time. So suppliers, uh, we certainly need to support in, in that revenue generation ambition. And on the operator or customer side, uh, we're seeing this new landscape where a huge investment is going to be needed into the enterprise sector uh, that wasn't um, experienced before that needs to be scaled in that capital constrained environment. Uh, and I'm often hearing frustration from my operator customers where strategy session meetings end with a line being drawn when the capital budget runs out. And as an industry, I think we can do better. You know, we, we had to diversify when we moved from node-based to cloud-based software. And, and 5G really isn't any different in that sense. We just need to adopt those new business models. So from an asset finance perspective, as said, many different parts of banking, I work in uh, active assets less than 12 years. And we created a subscription model. And, and that very much is a way that Macquarie deploys our balance sheet, our capital, uh, into a project such that the supplier is still paid in the normal course of events during the implementation period. So giving them that recurrent revenue forecast that they really need. But equally, the customers don't need to pay until they're receiving the benefit of that technology, be that revenue increase or, or operational efficiency. And, and what we see from a CFO perspective is increasingly uh, an ambition to look beyond the TCO of any particular project that has structured financing included in it, but look at the wider possibilities across their business in terms of if we had more cash flow to deliver more of those innovative project projects, what could we achieve? Uh, so look, I feel really passionately that, that we're better as an industry. We, we shouldn't be walking into 5G, scrambling around for new business models. And uh, we know what we need to do and we know we need to invest more to change, to hit those sustainable development goals, but equally to further the ambitions of our industries and, and us as a broader society. So I don't know what the motion will be today, but I certainly know that investment plays a huge role in, in that 2030 target, but also to achieve uh, that capital progress um, that we need to across the industry. Thank you very much, Amy. It's always always great to get the the, the investment side from the from the financial community itself. Uh, and Greg, finally, if I might come to you in terms of what you've been you've been driving within within the UK market in particular, but many years of, of working in the industry, uh, I think you have quite a different view uh, of investment. So please please share the City Fiber perspective. Thank you, thank you all for in inviting me, and and I I think it's uh, fantastic that we can get to do all these things uh, remotely and that's all because of the wonderful communication systems and platforms that have been invented over the last just decades. 
Um, City Fiber, I'm the CEO of City Fiber. I, I personally have been in building infrastructure across uh, five different European countries. The UK is, is the latest one where I'm involved with, um, and City Fiber builds pure fiber infrastructure across the UK. Uh, we focus on all the cities outside of London. We build um, th that target market is roughly 100 cities. That'd be 40% of the UK. We're building across presently 67 cities, and that's about 35% of the UK's GDP. It's a four billion pound investment program, all privately funded today with infrastructure equity as well as infrastructure debt. Um, it's covering eight million uh, consumer premises. It covers 800,000 business sites. It covers 200,000 small cell sites, um, which are capable of hooking on plus all the macro sites. And it also covers roughly 50,000 public sector sites. So it's full fiber infrastructure, almost at a utility level across a whole city. Um, the key to our model and the key to, I think, the new model of investment for the data service providers or the infrastructure providers is, is, a, is more of a purely wholesale. So the retail model uh, in the days past where they could afford to, to build their own infrastructure is, is I think, is, is perhaps gone now. And that's why the tower sharing, that's why the data centers are being shared. And it's the same thing with these big dense fiber networks that roll out across cities. If you can build these all in a new architecture that addresses all the needs and open it up as a wholesale market, then you can have all the different service providers come, come on to that network. In our case, we're anchored with long-term contracts, 10, 20, 30 year contracts. In the consumer space, the big consumer retail ISPs, give us minimum volume or minimum revenue commitments that are equal to roughly 20% of everything we build. Um, the mobile providers like three that we have a nationwide contract, that is they've given us every mobile site, small cells as, rather, as well as macro across every city we build in the UK. And we just drop them off the old infrastructure they're on and put them on dark fiber infrastructure, multiple fiber pairs, giving them unlimited bandwidth. Um, the businesses, each business park we roll into, we just roll in and cover those and then the public sector. Now, all of that financing has been done in, in as I say, said, about a $4 billion investment program. But the difference today than in back in the late 90s is we had a model in the late 90s when we built in Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, where it was more build it and hope they came. And of course, with the dot-com collapse, that crushed almost all the pure fiber infrastructure providers out there. However, in today's market, instead of building it and hoping they'll come, we actually have secured over 5 billion pounds worth of commitments, ironclad cash take or pay or minimum volume commitments, or just anchor contracts, whereas as we build the network, they pay us. So we've actually have about a 1.2, 1.3 times payback before we put a shovel in the ground. Those are our minimum volume commitments. So you, you can get a two, three, four times payback pretty quickly as you just start rolling out this infrastructure. The other thing to think of is, as Macquarie would know, is the yields. So what, what we do is I, we take our minimum volume commitments and we actually, as we build our network, those minimum volume commitments throw off a 10 to 15% yield on the infrastructure assets that we build it. Therefore, we're actually building a whole new asset class, pure fiber infrastructure across these towns and cities, purely with developmental equity, who has a longer profile, seven to 15 years, and then with infrastructure debt, and the infrastructure debt now is enabled to come into these, these markets, into fiber, whereas five years ago they couldn't. So unlocking fiber as an infrastructure class has really been transformational for the industry. So, so and lastly, who should do this? Now, what, what really is taking place, and I can't speak for the developing countries, I can speak for the, the Western developing countries, the US and, and, and Europe for sure, and most other, other spots, is it really is done most economically from anybody but the incumbent. And I know that sounds very paradoxical to what's going on, but the, 
what, what's really taking place is the incumbent is locked up in revenue streams, old architecture, antiquated systems, and for him to roll out a new revolutionary infrastructure, he has to charge more. The difficulty with that is a, a, a then it's an incremental fee that the consumer needs to pay. Whereas in our model, we can roll out a brand new infrastructure without any um, encumbrances of old systems, old platforms, old, old ways of doing things, to be honest. And we can roll out a brand new architecture and we can charge the consumer almost what he's paying today and give him a hundred times the bandwidth, better reliability, and he's not paying any more. Now, the only people that can really do that is a fresh new entrance. So in the case of the, the industrialized nation, these type of models are really now have matured to the point where you can bring in a competitive infrastructure provider and that competitive infrastructure provider can carry itself across these markets. Thank you very much indeed, Greg. It's uh, always great to see innovation driving change uh, in, in so-called mature markets. Thank you very much. So having heard the initial uh, statements from our witnesses, I'm now going to uh, cycle back through uh, and get a little bit more information. So Ulf, if I might turn to you, how do you maximize the return on investment with such a large scale player like T-Mobile in the US? Well, we have actually gone about it uh, by changing a lot of things. And as you said, innovation is, is, is super important, not only to innovate in top of the network, but also how we actually build it. And um, I'd like to tie back to Amy's comment also about being able to build in areas where nobody's built before. Um, as you might, some of you might know, the merger uh, with Sprint comes with a number of big commitments, which among others is also build the network very strong in rural America. And we're doing that. And just to give a flavor, this when we turn out these 5G sites, it's quite a big difference when they come to town. Um, they, uh, they actually deliver more than 10 times of uh, 4G in terms of speeds, uh, much shorter latency. It's a, it's a very, very big change. And that has given us you know, the opportunity to actually, we can tie business, uh, business development that we do in rural America, for example, on our T-Mobile for Business part and other parts of the company to turning up and bringing these uh, two and a half G sites uh, uh, to 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 um, to areas where nobody's ever built that kind of strong infrastructure before, and where there is lack of infrastructure in general. I'd also say that what we've done is we've implemented uh, what we call a lean mythology. Uh, if you're familiar with lean, in terms of uh, yielding the most possible uh, returns on every site we build. So every month we decide what sites we want to build and we build those that yields the biggest returns. So by that, you could say that we are changing the model of just having a big plan, a mega big plan that we are going to roll out over the years. We actually decide continuously where we put every site and we expect that we will be doing that and by that we will be winning with accuracy we will have the highest possible accuracy in terms of what we put the investments and if you look at a nation like us it's a big country it's it's thousands and thousands and thousands of sites and to be able to make this work we have built a completely new logistics process a completely new process in the company of how we roll out the network something that i think very few if any operator in the world has actually done um, that's going to, for us, yield a bigger return on investment and be able to make sure that we are accurate uh, in terms of addressing customers. And as you know, we're calling ourselves the uncarrier. Um, the uncarrier meaning that we're here to solve customer pain points and we're here to provide provide a better experience than anyone else. And I think that's what it's ultimately all about, whatever business you're in. So that's what we call We call it 5G for all. Thank you very much, Elf. A great story, and I say in a, in a competitive market, it's great to see really pushing those boundaries, especially in the rural communities. Uh, Tim, if I might come back to you, uh, talking specifically about the African market, um, I guess two questions really: one at a national level, one at a, at a, on a continental level. Uh, what is what are governments doing to help in this, or are they leaving it purely to the market? And then secondly, what about any pan-African initiatives? And once again, it's an enormous geography to cover, but you know, are we beginning to see those sort of pan pan-continental activities that will help drive the internet backbone across the region? 
Yeah, th th those are both uh, very interesting questions. Um, uh, the first one as to what governments can and, and should be doing. Um, the, there is definitely a role for, for governments. Uh, the most obvious one is is to regulate the market, to introduce competition, uh, to ensure that um, investors have the, the best climate in which to invest. Um, I, I work a lot in Ethiopia, and uh, as you may know, Ethiopia has just uh, set up a, a new regulator uh, last year. And uh, um, last week, it actually issued the request for proposals for two new operators to enter the market. In fact, Ethiopia is probably the last of the big uh, developing country markets to open to competition. I think we still have Djibouti and Eritrea and maybe a couple of other smaller places to go. But Ethiopia is certainly the last of the big markets to open to competition. And the government has played a, a very active role there, as I say, in passing a new law, in establishing the regulator and in creating the, the, the right environment for, for investors. Um, in terms of uh, Pan-African initiatives, there are probably fewer of them than, than one might have hoped for. Certainly in the past, there's been very many regional initiatives and the World Bank itself has been uh, promoting a few regional initiatives such as the Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, which saw uh, new investment in, in countries like uh, uh, Uganda, um, Kenya, uh, Comoros, etc. But um, one area which is uniting, um, I would say, African leaders at the moment is this, this commitment to achieve universal broadband access in Africa by the year 2030. Um, that's been adopted by the African Union, by the International Telecommunication Union, and by the World Bank Group. And it, it, it really is a, a target that focuses the mind because 2030, it's only 10 years away and, and the, the gap uh, to get from where we are now to universal broadband uh, coverage in, in Africa is, is huge. So as I mentioned earlier, the World Bank has committed itself to a, a digital economy for Africa initiative, which will see an investment of uh, around about $50 billion between now and 2030 to achieve that goal of universal broadband access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I think the, one of the things we introduced in one of the debates earlier was the notion of plain old broadband, just POB as a new acronym, which is that you know, we need that for that universal service to make sure that everyone in wherever they are in the world can, can get that connectivity and build those services. Uh, Amy, if I might come back to you, uh, I, I get the impression from what you said that, that you're almost uncovering more optimism in the telecom industry about how they can leverage what they have on their balance sheets and, and their approach to investment. Uh, are, are there any immediate priorities in that or is it very much across the board for the, for the telecoms players with, with whom you work? I think that's a really interesting reflection and, and I'd certainly agree with that. Uh, in terms of areas of focus, I'd probably talk to um, the challenge of legacy estates. So in addition to um, debt asset financing, uh, Macquarie has a, a long history uh, in transacting asset, assets on the secondary market. And as, as we all know, for many reasons, whether it's diversification of the supply chain, geopolitical decisions or um, just increased competition in the market, we're seeing many operators rebalancing their networks. And, and one of the areas that uh, we're getting a huge amount of traction with um, in, in Macquarie is how can we support those operators moving and monetizing those large scale estates. So, uh, you know, the historic models have been a broker ad hoc approach to pulling and, and installing small amounts of uh, kit in and out of the network. What we're seeing here is entire 3G, 4G estates coming out. And, you know, to the point that Tim's making, these are really valuable estates and they can be used elsewhere and help bridge that 2030 gap that we know we have. Uh, so I see a keen focus in that space um, from the operators. And of course, that in turn helps their balance sheet because what we're doing is funneling a whole lot of revenue back into the network's P&L so that uh, innovation in more projects can happen. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, and Greg, if I might come back to you, uh, you, you talk very, very passionately about, about what you're doing with City Fibre and driving that investment across the UK. Um, and you mentioned about in the past you looked at other European markets. Uh, is this is what you're doing applicable to pretty much any country in the world? Well, uh, for, for sure, it's replicatable in the mature Western country model. So there's a city fiber is, is in the UK, but there's a city fiber esque in Ireland. There's one in Germany. There's one in, in France. There's one in Italy. Um, and so and all of them are doing really, really well in in building fresh new fiber infrastructure and the key is pure fresh fiber infrastructure because 
it's really, really cheap is what we're learning once it goes in. It, it's quality of service, it's level of service, it's reliability, it's maintenance. All of that is just super cheap and it allows you to run broadband services that in the past you thought would be real expensive that allows you to run gigabit speeds into people's homes for 10, 15 pounds a month um, in a wholesale environment, which is equivalent to where we were a, a decade ago at 10 pounds for a 10, you know, a 10 megabit line that wasn't very good. So it really is transformational stuff. Um, it's certainly the amount of information that's coming to, to me directly and to my investors is it's spreading in the US also. So there are there are, if not tens, there's twenties, if not thirties type of pure fiber builders that are starting to emerge building pure fiber networks across towns, villages, then they're getting bigger and they're starting to do whole cities and they're doing during doing whole conurbations of that. Um, so it, it's definitely applicable. As you move into the developing world more, you don't have as much organized service provider revenue that you can anchor anchor across. So there's a little bit more of building at risk that must must occur. Although for you to get any type of ubiquitous 4G or 5G network out anywhere, you need a massive fiber plant. So some of the models that I've seen directly because they've been proposed to me is that somebody needs to put in a modern fiber plant into the, um, let's say, African countries almost simultaneous with the big rollouts of 4G and 5G because without really good fiber, fiber plants, you won't really ever get a really good mobile experience. And so for you to bring wireless mobile to huge swaths of population, you need a dense fiber network underneath, which once you're beginning to build that dense fiber network, the worst thing is if it's just trapped with the mobile operator, it might as well be open up to serve consumers, it might as well serve public sector, and it might as well serve businesses. And that's where a, a really evolution is, is that a pure fiber network can look like a utility if it's put in right and it's purely wholesale driven. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so pleased that we've come back to the wholesale debate, which we did, I think, five years ago at the telco debate. And obviously a lot of that is now being driven partly by the things that, that you're doing, of course, as a, with City Fiber and the like, but also by some of the national initiatives that we see in Italy and Poland and the like, where it's driving that, that more national level of activity. Guy, I think with that, I'm gonna hand back to you because I think we've, we've taken on board many different perspectives, uh, much optimism about the future of the industry, many different cycles of investment required, but also the availability of investment from different sources to, to drive that future telco industry. Thank you, Chris, and to all our experts. As usual, a great cross-section of thoughts and perspectives. Right, you've been presented with the facts and now we want you to participate. You may have your own questions for our witnesses. Well, send them in to us and we'll include them in our live show, which is on Thursday, December the 10th at 4 p.m. UK time. Now get ready to vote because here comes our motion. And the motion is, investors will drive a separation of the industry into an InfraCo and Servco model. Well, that's our motion and Chris and Graham have tossed the great telco debate commemorative coin for one final time this year to see who's going to speak for and against the motion. And Chris, you win the final toss of this year and you have the honor of speaking first and presenting your views for the motion. Thank you, Guy. This is, a, as Graham said, this is a real gritty issue around the industry and obviously the way it was funded in the past when it was a monopoly, then that, that had fundamentally different dynamics. As the industry looks to strive to connect more fibre, to drive more fibre out into every part of a, a national infrastructure, as it looks to drive more 5G, it's dealing with very different investment cycles. So trying to handle all of those within the telco, within a traditional telco, is fundamentally challenged. The availability of finance from third parties, the drive from people investing in tower infrastructures, in third party fiber infrastructures, is all changing the dynamic and the way in which funding is coming in. As Graham said, that draw upon CapEx and the requirement to build out. 
the separation of the function of the telecom business into the infrastructure, which provides the fiber and the towers to deliver those services, and into a servco, which actually delivers the services to the customers, is much more likely to drive the right outcomes, both for the economy and for the people using these services, whether that's in a business or in a consumer context. Yes, it differs by country, it differs by the way in which different telcos are positioned within those individual markets, but fundamentally, we need to drive the right investment to get the right infrastructure and the right services into place to support the digital future. Thank you, Chris. And now it's Graham's turn to present his views against the motion. Thank you, Guy, and thank you, Chris. So, uh, look, I've uh, I, I flipped the coin, and I'm going to argue against this motion. I want you to argue. Uh, I want you to vote against the motion. Uh, and here's why. Look, this whole uh, infraco and servco thing. I mean, it sounds great, doesn't it? Uh, but it's something that's uh, you know, dare I say it, being dreamt up in a smoke-filled room by maybe bankers, management consultants, regulators, people who don't really understand how the telco industry works and how telco technology works. And I think my point is that if, look, it's okay for, for, for a way to, to regulate the local loop. I mean, you know, that, that's fine. But, but, but doing it on a broader basis uh, is really dangerous and it will actually stifle innovation. The reason I would say that is because there's a great deal of integration now between the, the core network and the IT systems of the telco and the natural physical network technology. And that allows uh, innovation to be driven uh, by, the, by the people who own those inf that, that, that infrastructure, that physical infrastructure. Um, if you separate the physical infrastructure from, from the service provision, then you're basically just going to slow things down. You're going to slow down innovation and differentiation. Uh, and in the end, the customers will suffer. So please vote against the motion. Thank you, Graham. So we have our two very compelling arguments for and against. But what do you, our audience, think? Are you for or against the motion? Have your views been influenced by any of our expert witnesses? Or have Chris or Graham's last minute arguments changed your mind? Vote now. There are green and red buttons below this video, for and against. Just click the one that matches your choice. And next to that's an area where you can submit your questions for our live show, when we will continue the debate and then reveal the final motion results. Thank you to all our guests for taking part today. You've given us a lot to think about. Very much appreciated. Don't forget, there will be six debates and six corresponding motions. Catch them all and then come and join us for our live end of year Great Telco debate. Goodbye for now.